Hello everyone, welcome back to the Bucket Think Tank, and today we're going to talk about pretty much everything we've seen so far in terms of Disney royalty from Snow White to the Black Cauldron. So let's start with the easy stuff, which is the Disney Prince. So looking from Florian to Tarin, what have we learned? Well, from the first two, not much. It's a bit of a shame that Florian and Henri are sort of they're cut out of the film for one reason or another, whether it's um, animation restraints or time. But we sort of get an idea that their characters are more intertwined into their princess, even going by the um, the film itself. Even if you add the scenes in, their ultimate purpose is to save the girl or love the girl, especially for Henri in Cinderella. He doesn't have much to do at all. And you could argue that because... Well, Cinderella is much is a much tighter story. I think it's more Cinderella focused, and I say this because in Snow White, it's the relationship between the evil queen and Snow White that actually pulls it. Lady Tremaine has no real impact on on Reed. The, the two never meet; they see each other. That's kind of it. With Philip, Philip is the step in the proverbial right direction because where Florian and Henri are sort of idealized, almost mythical ideas of a fairy tale prince. Philip actually is that archetypal fairy tale prince. He's dashing, he's good looking, he says all the right things, he knows how to swoop the ladies off their feet, he kills a dragon, he rides a horse epically, who's also apparently his best friend. He shows an amazing amount of confidence and control that is only really rivaled by Aurora's amount of confidence and control. There's no real theme linking these three up except they, except their love of said girl. And that isn't horribly a bad thing, but we'll see this fleshed out more in the Disney Renaissance. Actually, we'll see it really fleshed out in later films. Arthur and Tarwin are unique because, well, they're put center stage in a way that even Philip wasn't. But their story has less to do with romance and dreams and more about, you know, reality if we're trying to be nice here Arthur learning to you the importance of using his brain of love of wisdom and to guide himself to a better position to a better future where he can make those things happen so hopefully no one has to be like him you know feeling worthless trapped in a system that won't let him grow and so on and so forth the problem with Arthur is Merlin's there and but what I mean by that is Merlin is way more interesting to the point where even the quote-unquote villain, Madame Mim, interacts more is, interacts more because of Merlin. Like, she only wants to really destroy Arthur because she's because he's connected to Merlin and she hates Merlin. Even Sir Ector really only does what he does because of Merlin. With Tarin, Tarin is, is he gets more of the adventure story. And it shows. I mean, he has these ideas. I'm going to be a great hero. I can do it. It's fun and everything. And then he gets the harsh reality that this isn't a game. There's no timeouts. There's no there's no do-overs. There are lives at stake here. And then we see Tarun sort of investing in the idea of what he sees as the mark of a hero, the mark of a great warrior. And then at the end, he sort of hits this epiphany that we sort of see Hercules deliver forth at the end. That the true mark of a hero is not his strength, but in his heart. And along those lines, but I think Tarwin does it a bit better. And at least Tarwin also has a princess, which made that review a bit more fun, although Alonri doesn't have much to do in that film. Disney Prince is a bit inconsistent at this point, and it's primarily because they don't have much to do other than let's save person. Coming up to the Disney Princess, you could argue the same thing that we just said about the prince, where well, the purpose is to fall in love. Well, I wouldn't go that far. In my opinion, there's more work put into the Disney Princess line, primarily because the, uh, primarily our first three, we're seeing idealized versions of people we should try to be. You know, Snow White's innocence, Cinderella's resolve, Aurora's hope. Along, along those lines, we should strive to be that way. And what I mean is, when things start to change, despite the situation you're in, you hold on to those positive traits, and if we could all just help each other, we'd be a lot better off. A lot of what these first three films are is sort of an 
inverse of what you would expect. It's not Snow White's adventure. It's the Seven Dwarfs' adventure meeting her. It's the Evil Queen's um, dealing with her. Snow White's more reactive where every other character is active. And the same thing could go for Cinderella. And the same thing for Sleeping Beauty, or Aurora. And if you were to sort of look at these three objectively, because it's easy to say which one of the Disney princes is the strongest one, Philip, and if you want to stretch further, I would say Arthur a bit more than Tarin. But you could have a discussion about it being Tarin, but I think Philip is still at the top of even those two. Because he feels like a much more Im imposing force on the story and the narrative. But you can't ignore Tarin's um, journey, his own personal journey, which I think might put him at the top from that standpoint. But looking at our three, and along we, we have to wonder, okay, who goes in what order? Which one is the definitive? For the Saren, I would honestly say we put uh, along with sadly at the bottom. Actually, no, Aurora's at the bottom, and I say this because Aurora's design is great, but Aurora's own focus in the story is kind of she's in love, and that's kind of it. I mean, there's a lot more to be said. There's a lot of emotional weight being dropped on her when she finds out who she is and that she can't marry Philip, and so on and so forth. But for the most part, she's very much removed from the story in a way even Snow White wasn't. Snow White's informed very early on, oh yeah, your stepmother wants you dead. Wants you dead, get out of here. And then she's put in that really dangerous scenario. Alonwi is a bit higher than um, Aurora, primarily because Alonwi is almost a bit like a superhero to an extent because nothing really gets her in trouble. Or at the very least, she doesn't react like she is in trouble. But she's very aware of the trouble she's in. This is especially true with how you know she's trying to find a way out. She's, she's taking a lot of initiative. Just in the fact that she's searching through the castle trying to find a way out. But at the same time, she doesn't do much after that. Now, this has been a bit more in line with the book. Especially with how Alonwi doesn't let Tarin draw the sword. Because she notices a symbol of power on it. And that becomes a deal later. As well as her trying to... Um, perform magic but here she's just only just above um, Aurora as you could almost interchange them if you want um, next up is Snow White now most people think Snow White goes at the top but I would have to disagree because Snow White at her core is more noted for being the template you know where we where everything comes from the sense of innocence that she has is what drives her a bit is what well, not what drives her, but drives other people to help her. Snow White's crime, well, it's not even a crime, but the issue is is that she's, I think, possibly the most passive, but it's not in a bad way. I think we, we're a bit hard on her by mocking her naivete, but I think it's more to the fact that at her core, she, when she sees someone in trouble, her first instinct is to help them. Her good nature is what does her in, and it, it's really, I wouldn't call it a fault. I mean... If your greatest weakness is you're a good person, it's kind of a pretty good weakness to have, in my opinion. At the top, we have Cinderella by default. And the real reason I think she goes at the top is because at the end of it, what really determines what puts emphasis on the Disney princess line is the sense of dreams. And how each of these princesses handles those dreams at the core. So with Aurora, her dreams are kind of just those dreams she never feels like she's in a bad situation until, again, the end. But when she has a dream, she's like, I had this great dream, I met a guy, and it seems like she has this dream casually. And it was a great dream, to be sure, but not really one that you feel gets her through the day. Alonri has no actual dream, so technically from a dream standpoint, she would go below Aurora. Snow White's dreams are important, to be sure, but at the same time, these dreams are... She never she holds a very steadfast approach to them. There's never a point where she feels that it's anything less than impossible. Like she hopes for them, she prays for them, and she knows like someday her prince will come. That's kind of it. With Cinderella, her dreams are much more important because they get her through the day. They're things that, as we said in our review, she guards them preciously. And because of those dreams, she's able to get through the day in this house where she is not loved and not respected, or at least by her quote-unquote family. Again, in her room, she is safe, she is happy, 
and then reality sets in and it's time to go to work. And then when going to the ball, the first hurdle is her step family, which causes her so much stress and sadness, it starts tearing away her dreams. And then she gets the moment to live her dream and she should be happy, she should really be happy. But then when there's a chance to live that dream fully, it's denied her. And because of that, she breaks down at her fullest. The dream element is, I think, what makes Cinderella the definitive Disney princess for this era. And I think we'll see her template carry on everywhere else. And I would say, from a Disney prince standpoint, it's actually two characters. It is Tarin and Philip. But more Tarin. Because Tarin's dreams are actually what sets him aside from everyone else, regardless of how flaky, well not flaky, but simplistic they are. He dreams of being a hero. We'll see princes later on that have these dreams of other things for themselves, and they have to grow up through them to achieve any semblance of them. And we'll see something similar with Disney princesses. So, at the end of it, we've learned that our Disney royalty lineup in, at this era is at its infancy, very much so. We're seeing a lot of things being laid down as groundwork, we're seeing a lot of strong characters. We're seeing a lot of what Disney is best known for, and that is strong side characters. And those side characters have a much more impact of us understanding our characters. It's not something as simple as, oh, well, she's nice because animals like her. But she's nice, therefore we help her, and through this interaction, you understand us more. And it sort of helps things flesh out more and be understood on a deeper level. And with that, my Walker Brings video to a close here. Um, if you have any thoughts on what we've um, gone over so far, feel free to leave that down in the comment section. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I will catch you all later when we go under the sea. This is the Buckley Think Tank signing out. May your fandom serve you well.